So I think I've cracked the code. As soon as I come up with an idea and manufacture an, an original idea, uh, because there's just nothing going on, and I'm about to start rolling, that's when the news breaks. Uh, like everybody else, uh, the news caught me off guard, surprised me, happy surprise, uh, that the White Sox picked up Liam Hendricks uh, on a three, really a four-year deal. Uh, we are going to take a look at the newest White Sox, uh, really celebrate this great signing. Uh, he's the top available free agent reliever in all of baseball, and the White Sox got him. And we'll also take a look at his very, very unusual contract uh, towards the end of the video because it is something that we have never seen before in Major League Baseball. It's something completely unique and strange and actually really smart, and it's confused a lot of people. So I'm gonna explain why it was structured the way it was. But first, we are just gonna celebrate. In the comments, please leave any kind of comment or question you might have for me. Later this week, I do wanna do a Q&A type of video, an opinion of your own, and I can comment on it. Whatever you want me to sound off on, please do leave that in the comments below. And I do thank everybody for subscribing and commenting. This has been such a fun thing. I've had this channel for a long time, uh, but just in the last two months, maybe, no less, barely over a month, uh, it suddenly has really taken off. Um, not like crazy numbers or anything, but still like over a hundred subscribers in the last month. And, uh, and it's been really a lot of fun to engage with a lot of you on uh, here on YouTube, uh, sharing ideas, uh, talking baseball, talking White Sox baseball, something that we all obviously love. Also leave in the comments, what is left on your White Sox off-season wish list? Uh, I'll give you a moment to think about it. I will reveal mine at the very end of this. Um, but I'm telling you, at the top of my wish list, most of this off-season, it was Liam Hendricks. And I can't believe that the White Sox went out and got one of the top available uh, pitchers that was available via trade. Now, we didn't, I don't think, know how much Blake Snell or Yu Darvish would be available. But, uh, but Lance Lynn was definitely one of the top trade targets in all of baseball. The White Sox got him. Top available pitcher, Liam Hendricks. White Sox got him too. What a great offseason so far. And it was so funny because last night, Shy Sox fan Mike on Twitter, if you don't follow him, follow him. He's a lot of fun. He pointed out that the White Sox payroll is so low. Now, what do you do with this information? And I tweeted, add Liam Hendricks. And, um, and it was just maybe an hour or two later that Liam Hendricks appears. There's a lot of people that say, that look at his overall body of work and say that, well, he was really only good for the last year, right? He wasn't that great like this, you know, 2019 and 2020. Before then, maybe he was kind of a, a middle of the road, a mediocre player. And first off, uh, I don't think that's totally accurate. When people are looking at his overall stats, a couple of things, number one, Yes, he started off not that good, and then he got better. And so some of those bad ERAs, some of those bad stats from the beginning of his career, just like Lucas Giolito, they're gonna follow him around a little while, but I don't think any of us are doubting is Lucas Giolito a good player. Um, just like Hendricks, he, he turned the page in his career. Also though, when he went to Toronto, that's when he began to take on the role of a reliever. Half of his major league career, he was a starter, and for whatever reason, he was not quite cutting it as a starter, but as a reliever, he has been exceptional. Let's look beyond the last two years and look at his entire time in Oakland, uh, which is covering five years. Now, I know ERA is not something that stat has really loved to talk about, but just because we're going to keep it easy, keep it light when it comes to the numbers here, we will look at it. In Oakland, in his last five years, he posted a 308 ERA, which is about a whole point below his lifetime career number of 410. And then if you look at Sierra, which is my favorite ERA predictor, it, they actually have him coming at it at about 1.8, which is right, 1.8 or 1.9, which is right on target for what he did last year uh, as far as ERA goes. So his predicting stats, um, they, they might say a tiny bit of regression, but they're also saying that he is completely talented. He's a very, and it's undeniable that he's a very, very, very talented player. And you just look at something really fun it is so hard for a relief pitcher to get Cy Young Award votes. He got them. Not only that, he got MVP votes last year, which is almost unheard of. And just looking at the Cy Young Award votes last year, if you're a White Sox fan, you are very happy. Because the Sox have the 5th place finisher in Dallas Keuchel, 6th place Lance Lynn, 7th place Lucas Giolito, and then ninth place Liam Hendricks. Uh, that is an embarrassment of riches that we are totally fine with. Oh, and let's not forget his playoff history. Now, when it comes to the playoff experience, to me, I don't care so much about the results so much as I do care about 
just the, the, the fact that they have been there. They have been in those high leverage, high pressure situations. The postseason is a whole different animal. And Liam Hendricks has more experience than you might expect in the postseason. Uh, of course, we know he was there last year. Why? Because he did well against us. But he also appeared in the postseason in 2019, 2018, 2015. And just looking at last year, he had three appearances with five and two thirds innings logged. Uh, which shows you he's a guy that when the pressure is on, he can throw more than one inning to get those important outs. I mean, he is just a gamer. He is a dedicated, hard-nosed, tough pitcher. Very much somebody that the White Sox fans love, myself included. And, um, of course, he's an Aussie, too. And um, just extra shout-out after five years living in Hawaii. I have a little extra place in my heart for somebody from the South Pacific. So, welcome aboard, mate. Now, looking back, a lot of Sox fans are wondering why did the White Sox go so hard at Liam Hendricks and not just bring back Alex Colomay? He's available. He's been with us. We know what to expect from him. And he is somebody that I would love to see back in White Sox uniform. It might be uh, really asking for a lot because at this point, he has earned his place as a closer. We will see how the market develops for him. And in this moment, we should absolutely look back on the quality performance that Alex Colomay gave the White Sox in 2019 and 2020. In the last two years with the White Sox, he had combined for 42 saves and a kind of crazy 2-2-7 ERA. He's never been a big strikeout pitcher, which is something that the advanced stats don't look very kindly on. And because of that, his ERA estimators are usually way higher than the actual results. Now, is he a guy that will continue to outperform those predictors? Maybe he is. Maybe that's just his style. For whatever reason, guys don't make really solid contact. They put the ball in play a lot, but not in any kind of a meaningful way. But it's because of that, the fear that he was going to regress, and he was going to regress big time, that the White Sox opted to move on. Had Liam Hendricks gone somewhere else, the White Sox would have been very happy to bring back Alex Colomay as their plan B option. And let's also take our hat off to Colomay, what he did in the postseason this last year for us. Yes, it was just a small three-game set, but he appeared in two of those games, saved one of them, and was just about perfect with his two innings pitch. The only base runner he allowed was one person via walk. And looking back at the trade that brought him to the White Sox, uh, the White Sox sent Omar Narvaez, our at the time starting catcher, over to Seattle. Uh, he for, for a catcher, he had a really great bat, was kind of middling when it came to his defensive side. Uh, but definitely a quality player went to Seattle. Narvaez really blossomed in Seattle, eventually putting up 22 home runs in 2019. But then he was traded out to Milwaukee and uh, had a really off year. So I I'm expecting him to bounce back uh, in 2021 from Milwaukee. But now let's take a look at that really strange contract, the one that has gotten the message boards really confused about what exactly is going on here. Before we get into that, actually, let's talk about the market in general. The beginning of the offseason, Brad Hand had a $10 million club option for 2021 with the Cleveland Indians. He had had a great season. It seemed like a really reasonable contract for a quality, a high quality reliever. And I had wished the White Sox picked him up at 10 million and still went out and got Hendricks. But every team in baseball passed on Brad Hand at $10 million. And everybody thought that that meant it was going to be a terrible market this year. There were a lot of players that either had their contracts bought out rather than uh, having their club option picked up. There were some big surprises, namely Adam Duvall out in Atlanta, who had his contract just dropped rather than go to arbitration. It looked like it was going to be a very, very, very cold marketplace for players in general, including very talented relievers. The prediction at the beginning of this offseason from MLBTradeRumors.com was that Blake Trennan would get a two-year $14 million deal which at that rate, I was actually hoping the White Sox would pick him up as a middle relief option, but he ended up signing a two-year $17.5 million deal that included a club option for 2023. That just went down a week ago, and at that time, I wrote, this is a surprise that he got so much, and it's probably going to push up the contracts of Liam Hendricks and maybe even Alex Colomay. Fangraphs was very bullish on him as well, thinking that he would land a three-year, anywhere between 30 and $36 million. I was still thinking as the top reliever, an overall $45 million for three years. I thought that would have been kind of reasonable for him. But then he got this, which is a very uniquely structured contract. So there's two sides here. There's what it technically on paper is and what it is in reality. Technically, it's three years, $54 million. In reality, it's kind of four years, $54 million. And I'll explain what that means, why that is. Uh, but first, we have to take a look at why. Uh, we have to take a look at the luxury tax threshold. Now, um, Many of you watching this might maybe already know how this all works, but really quickly I'll go over. Baseball doesn't have a salary cap. 
teams can pay however much money they want, but if they get over a certain amount, then they have to pay a tax and it's an escalating tax over years and how much you go over and all that. Won't go into the weeds on it, but also it's not calculated just by how much your daily payroll adds up. You take the player's average salary over the life of their contract, average that out, and that is what the luxury tax hit is. I was actually gonna do a whole separate video on this because it is a bigger thing, but just again, really quickly looking at it, let's just take a look at Yohan Moncada. He signed a five-year, $70 million extension a few years back, uh, actually just last year. Those numbers go up each year. Uh, this coming year, he's gonna make 6.8 million. The year after that, 13.8, 17.8, and 24.8. But the average, his luxury tax hit is $14 million per year. So it creates these weird moments where this year he's only going to make $6.8 million, but he's going to have a $14 million impact on our luxury tax threshold before we start to get that those penalties. However, by 2024, he'll be making $24.8 million, but it'll still only be impacting our luxury tax line by $14 million. Right now, the Sox payroll is so low, we don't have to worry about the luxury tax at all. We are quite a ways below it. But in time, as arbitration salaries keep going up, as we hopefully extend Lucas Giolito, uh, we are going to get closer and closer and closer to that threshold. It's really been a very, very big positive that the White Sox have been able to sign so many of their young stars to long-term extensions, but there still will be other expenses that will be coming up in the coming years. Okay, so how is this contract structured? $54 million over three years, but if he pitches a fourth year, it's still $54 million? Yes, and here's how. He will get on average $13 million per year for the first three years of the contract, which again is actually below what I thought he would be getting. That fourth year club option, usually there'll be something like, it's a $15 million option, but there's a $2 million buyout, meaning if the club doesn't wanna pick it up, they just pay $2 million and the player goes away. In this case, the club option and the buyout are the same amount of money there, $15 million either way. How does that make sense? It makes sense because the buyout of the contract, no matter what it is, does factor into his luxury tax. So the full $54 million will be dispersed as far as the luxury tax goes over the first three years. Meaning if the White Sox do pick up his fourth year, which why wouldn't they? Because they're already paying him anyway. His luxury tax hit will be 18 million per year for the first three years. And again, we've got a lot of space, but in year four, when he's making $15 million, the luxury tax hit will be $0 because we've already paid for that hit. It is an unbelievable loophole that I can't believe other people haven't noticed by now. I mean, granted, I didn't come up with it either, uh, but it is something that's kind of brilliant. And I would say goes against the spirit of what the league was trying to do with uh, creating this luxury tax thing. It's probably something that will somehow be eradicated in the next CBA because it is a um, it is a loophole that Rick Hahn has found. So hats off to him or the White Sox, whoever it was in the organization that thought, hey, we could do this. Also, hats off to a MLB Trade Rumors uh, user named Dorothy Mantooth. Um, first off, Dorothy Mantooth was a saint, and don't you ever forget it. And also, big props to the Cyril Figgis avatar. Uh, but he was the one that was really breaking it down better than a lot of the sports writers. You get interactions like this a lot in message board. 18 million a year, that's crazy. No, it's 13 million per year for the first three years. And then the fourth year, at $15 million. But since the fourth year is already a fully guaranteed option, it counts as 18 mil for the first three years. And in year four, it'll be zero against the competitive balance tax. Um, and then he puts it in good perspective, which is actually less than what the Giants paid for Mark Melancon. So the knee-jerk reactions have been very negative, which is really funny. And, and some other people have pointed it out that uh, people constantly complain about the White Sox not spending enough money. And then this contract comes in and then everybody's all up in arms that we paid too much money. You can't have it both ways, and you're paying a premium. Obviously, the Sox didn't go to this number unless they had to go to this number to get the guy they were looking for. And it will be quite interesting to see what Alex Colomay ends up fetching. The, the White Sox have addressed some really big needs. They they have a right fielder in Adam Eaton now. They've got a, a new uh, front-line pitcher with Lance Lynn. They picked up the best reliever in, in Major League Baseball, be their new closer. What is left? What is on your wish list? I hope you've written it in the comments. If not, still have time. Here's what I'm looking for. Uh, we still do need a left-handed bat. Um, Adam Eaton helps. I'm cautiously optimistic that the Adam Eaton signing is something that's going to pay positive dividends, but it's certainly no slam dunk. I think if the season were to start today, Zach Collins would end up being our designated hitter. He is a left-handed bat with a really good eye, but he's very, very unproven at the major league level. 
Um, the biggest available free agent out there hitting from the left side is Michael Brantley. It is just tough to find a lefty. If we didn't need to care about handedness at all, I would be all for going for the likes of Marcelo Zuna. But Michael Brantley, uh, at 34 years old, maybe the White Sox could get him for just two years. I, I'm not really optimistic that that will happen. Uh, I think now that the free agent market is opening up, I think somebody's going to offer him three years. And I really don't want the White Sox to go too long with any new signings because we do have good, talented guys not too far down the pipeline. And speaking of that, you might be wondering, well, let's see, do we have a good left-handed bat in our minor league system that we could call up immediately to be our uh, designated hitter? Well, first off, nobody will have the experience that Zach Collins has while having the ability to catch as well. But just for the sake of the argument, we have Gavin Sheets, Luis Gonzalez, and Blake Rutherford. All of those guys are just about major league ready. They all hit from the left side. I think we're going to get to know those three names a lot in spring training because they will be given a very big look. Any of them taking that DH spot would be considered a dark horse at this moment. And speaking of spring training, will there be a really interesting non-roster invite that maybe ends up being the guy that comes out of nowhere and takes over the the role because it is there for the taking? I want to take just a half a second to address. There's a lot of people that said we shouldn't have signed Eaton, 7 million, and we shouldn't have signed Hendricks, 54 million, because we could have used that money to sign George Springer. First off, obviously, and I think the people writing this know that the $61 million wouldn't be anywhere near enough to just sign George Springer. Um, the, the guesses right now is that he'll sign for anywhere from 100, 120 million dollars, which would by far be the biggest contract in White Sox history. But also, I don't think we need somebody else clogging up a position long term. Also, the big thing that we're talking about a lot here is that he's a righty. He's he's not going to address the big need that we have. Oh, and plus, let's say we spend that 110 or so million dollars getting him. Well, we would still have to spend more money to get some sort of a closer, which may have ended up being Alex Colomay for 10 million or, or more a year. Uh, we just we'll, we'll see how the rest of the offseason plays out. But I am happy with the idea of not going after George Springer. Uh, based on just what our needs are exactly. I think we need at least one more middle relief option. Last year we had Ross Detweiler and Gio Gonzalez. They both served that role pretty well of being somebody that could mop up innings, whether it's during a game with a big lead or a big deficit. Uh, Guys that need to come in and go multiple innings if a starter falters. We don't quite have that yet. We have an amazing bullpen overall, well beyond Liam Hendricks. I love Cody, Cody Hoyer, Matt Foster, Um, Of course, Garrett Crochet. There are so many great players on our team, uh, but I would love that veteran presence, uh, a guy that can come in and eat a couple innings. And the only other thing I could really think of is a little bit of starting pitching depth. Um, Right now, we've got an awesome top four of Giolito, Keuchel, Lynn, and Cease. Uh, Who will be that fifth starter? I think right now, many people are penciling in Ronaldo Lopez. However, I think he kind of worked his way out of that role. I would love to see him. Maybe he will be the guy that can be that middle relief multi-inning option. And maybe he'll be so impressive that he gets another shot at the rotation. But really, I would love to see somebody else come in. Maybe Jonathan Stever wins that job out of spring training. Is Michael Kopech ready? We don't know. It's really too early to tell. Uh, Jimmy Lambert will be somebody that maybe gets a couple of starts this year. He got at least one or two last year. But this is such an unbelievable luxury that the White Sox and White Sox fans are in right now is that we are worrying about depth questions, not big glaring holes. How do we get somebody to play this position? We have really everything covered, and now we just need to keep building the team. I've got a couple of video ideas lined up, researched, ready to go. Uh, news broke. I'm hitting this first. But in the meantime, that gives you guys a little bit of an opportunity to either ask questions or, or share your opinions, and I will respond to them in a video coming up within the next week. Uh, go socks, and I'll see you next time.